Good morning, friends. We'll try it one more time. Good morning, friends. There we go. I can't hear any of the online people who are joining us, so it's up to you to make sure that I can hear a response. Thank you for joining us, whether you're in person or whether you're online. It's good to have you come together. We've got a few announcements. Uh, the first thing is we'd like to extend our condolences and our prayers to Shelley Townsend and her family. Her stepdad passed away this week, Larry Shortreed. And so uh, we do want to extend our condolences and to keep the family in our prayers this week. We also have some celebrations to uh, announce today. We've had the birth of a couple of little babies. So congratulations to Ali and Pa on the birth of Elmira on March 28th. And then uh, we heard through Kathy and Mo that Laura and Chris have had their baby uh, Noah on April the 20th, so congratulations to them as well. If you would like to make a donation to the church today, we're extremely grateful for all of the support uh, that we receive as a church to make sure that our ministries take place. If you would like to do that, there are three different ways that you can go about it. Because we are not passing a physical plate in the service, you can either drop a donation into the, the offering plate in the fireside room, there is a debit machine that you can do and use. There's also the option of giving it directly to one of us as staff, and we will make sure that it gets to the right place. For all of the other things and information about church life throughout the week, whether it's volunteer opportunities or small group opportunities, events and church life, please make sure that you're checking out our newsletter. If you do not receive our newsletter, then please talk to one of us and we'll make sure that you get connected to that resource. Friends, let's come together in our hearts and in our spirits as we join the worship team for our call to worship. So in the church calendar, Easter lasts for six weeks all the way until Pentecost. So we're still in the Easter season, and I wanted us to continue to celebrate with a lot of our Easter hymns this morning. I was drawn to the passage in Philippians 3 that begins, uh, chapter 3 begins, Rejoice in the Lord. And then Paul writes, I consider everything a loss because of the unsurpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. And then this is my favorite verse, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and to participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and so somehow to attain resurrection from that death. And then in chapter 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. To me, this is the heart of the good news, to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. So let us rejoice together and sing. I invite you to stand.
As we give our thanks to God for all that he has given to us, let us pray for the tithes and offerings as we worship. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day. In the midst of spring, we thank you for the rain, the snow, and uh, just all that you've given and made uh, in this earth. We thank you for this day as we have gathered together as the body of Christ to worship you, to honor you, to give of our lives and our talents and our time and our tithes and offerings. We thank you for everything that you have given to us so that we may be a blessing for you and serve to honor you in your kingdom. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, it is time for Children's Moment, and this week, Stephen and Faye Reynolds took the boxes, and they put something in here. So I haven't seen what this is. I have no idea what this is, so we're kind of creating Children's Moment together as we speak. So if I could have a drum roll, please. All right, we have a map, all right? And specifically, where, where is the map from specifically? British Columbia. British Columbia, all right. Who's been to British Columbia before? 
Who is, has anyone here never been to British Columbia? A few people have never been to British Columbia. Now, this is called Explore BC. So, I have here in this awesome map. So let's say I've never been to British Columbia before. And let's say that I open up the map and I look at things all over. Colleen, can you open up the map, please? So let's, let's say that I open up the map and I look at it and know all kinds of things about it so that I look at, I look at BC and I see, oh, well, there's Vancouver Island and I have memorized all the, why don't you point, point at the crowd? There we go. Well, I, I do. Oh, the northern part. Yeah. All right. So I could know all about British Columbia from this map. I could tell you all kinds of details. I could tell you what cities you're going to go through on the way to Vancouver. I can tell you all about the places that you can see in Victoria. But can you imagine if I had this map memorized inside and out, knew everything about it, but never actually went to BC? Wouldn't that be weird? That'd be kind of, I mean, that, within reason, right? There's some places that we can be fascinated with that we never get the chance to go to, and that's fine. But if I knew all about British Columbia but never went, that would be kind of funny. And if I talked to people about British Columbia obsessively and was like, oh yeah, British Columbia has this and this and this, and then they said, well, have you gone? And I was like, no. They would think I was kind of weird. And so we have opportunity all the time to learn amazing things. In the Bible, we have incredible things given to us, incredible things about how to live, and we can memorize every single scripture verse there is. We can know everything there is to know about the Bible by reading it. But if we don't actually put it into practice, it's not really that helpful. And so it's an important thing, like if we can memorize the Bible, or like memorize scripture, that's an important thing, it's a good thing to do. But if we just know about it, but don't do anything with it, well, that seems like that's kind of a waste. And so let's pray this morning that you can fold up the map, sorry. Or just like chuck it on the floor. Um, but uh, um, anyway, so we can, we can know all there is to know about BC from this map. But if we don't actually go, we're kind of missing out on something. And we can know all about the Bible, all the details. But if we don't actually live it, if we don't, if we know all the verses about loving people but don't really love people, and if we know all the verses about worshiping God but never worship God, it doesn't really, it's not, it's not really that helpful of a thing. So let's pray that with our map, with the Bible, that we actually listen to what it says and we actually live that out. So let us pray together. God, we thank you for today. We thank you for how good you are to us, for how much you love and you care for us. We thank you for all the things that you give us that help us to know the way to live, whether it's our family or our friends, whether it's the Bible, whether it's what we learn in church or learn from worshiping you. We ask, God, that we wouldn't just know these things about you, but we would actually live them out as well. So, God, we ask today that you would help us to hear what you have to say to us and not just hear it, but to do it as well. In Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand as we continue in worshiping our risen Lord. <clears throat> Jesus 
Friends, let's turn to John chapter 2 for our scripture reading today. We're going to begin in verse 1, and this is what it says. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples and all and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me, Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone jar water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, Everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best until now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother and his brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. May God bless the reading of his word. And now let's turn to God in prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, how good it is to gather in your name, to hear from your word, to pray together, to sing together, to worship your name, and to learn from your word. Lord, we pray for your blessing on our gathering here today. We also pray for your blessing on our CBWC sister churches that are also meeting today. We think of the churches in Medicine Hat and Brooks, Pincher Creek, Clare's Home, Cranbrook, and High River. Father, in each of these places, as other communities gather in the same name, we pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit would meet with each one. Lord, that your transforming power would be present in each gathering, and that these churches, their volunteers, and their leadership would be lights in their communities for your kingdom, and that your name will be glorified and honored. Our Heavenly Father, we also pray for the ministries of the soup kitchen and the food bank in Lethbridge, and the people that they serve. Father, may these resources be equipped and provided for so that they can continue to provide the services that are needed in our communities in increasing measure. And Father, we pray for the, the people that they serve as well, that we would always have before us the humanity of those who are in need, so that we can honor and respect and provide for each one in the way that they need and deserve, as children of God, as those who are created in your image. Father, today we also think of our mission working group. We thank you, Father, for the volunteers who provide us with vision and tangible structure to our mission within this church and reaching out to our community, to our province, our country, and to the world. Thank you, Father, for Steffi, for Kara, for Teddy, and for Ben. We pray that you would bless and guide their leadership of our mission working group and as they work to keep us connected to those who are in the field and who are doing important ministry in our midst. Father, as a community, we lift up Shelley and her family in the loss of her stepdad. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you would be a real and tangible presence in their grief and mourning. Father, as a community, we also celebrate the births of Elmira and Noah, and we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would touch these two infants and that in time they would come to know your name, that they would come to honor you as their God and serve you as their Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word that you have placed in Mark's mouth for us to hear today. 
We pray that you would bless him as he teaches us and that you would bless us as we listen and are changed. We ask these things in Jesus' holy name. There were uh, a few things that didn't go as planned this morning. One of them was that we were supposed to have a mission moment with Sean Horwood. And uh, in the first service, I realized he wasn't here. But that's because he was actually called in for a work emergency. And so, uh, yeah. But anyway, <clears throat> one of the things I thought I would share was the questions I was going to ask him. Uh, when we've been doing mission moments, we've shared about what kind of ministry people are involved in and connected with. And also what ways people see God at work in their workplaces. Uh, Sean is a manager at McDonald's and it is very intentionally leadership oriented in the work that he does and is very passionate about it. So the questions I had for him that maybe you want to reflect on yourself in terms of your own work or your volunteering or whatever it is that you're involved with, uh, maybe here's some questions to consider and we'll hear from Sean on these at some other date. <clears throat> First of all, what do you do as a vocation and what will you be doing at this time tomorrow? What do you find yourself giving thanks for at your work? Where do you see God present in your work? And so those are just some things that we can consider in our daily lives. Sometimes we just, we don't think about the ways that God is at work in the things that we do. And so it's a healthy thing for us to think about those. Um, sorry for those of you that were really hoping to hear Anna speak this morning. Um, she texted me yesterday and she was really very sick. And so we have swap dates, so she'll be speaking on her topic later on. Um, but in terms of what I'm going to be sharing, if it's like, if it like really bombs, that's, that's why. So there we go. So I have an out. I have an out. It, it, it works. So if you don't like it, well, it's, it's okay. Um, so habits are very important things. Habits can reset us when it feels like life is getting out of control. Habits ground us in what things are most important. And habits help us keep the most important things as the most important things in our lives. And habits can be silly, too, but they can still be quite helpful. Who uh, Raise your hand if you made any New Year's resolutions this year. Did anyone? Keep your hand up if you've still kept to them. Uh, yeah, Stephen's kind of like, I don't know. Anyway, uh, I, I made a couple and I've kept to them, but the only reason I've kept to them is because they're ridiculous. Uh, the first one was no French fries when I eat at a restaurant. And so it doesn't mean that I'm going super healthy. It means that, um, you know, when I go to McDonald's, I'm just being more creative off the menu. It's just an act of creativity expanding my palate, right? If I go to Original Joe's, instead of getting French fries and mashed potatoes, it'll just be two servings of mashed potatoes. So it's, it's not a health thing. It's just like it's, it's expanding my palate. Uh, and the other one is I've committed to spending 20 minutes a day building with Lego. And for the most part, I've done it, and it is a silly thing to do. We just have thousands and thousands of pieces of Lego. We have instruction books, and we have pieces scattered everywhere. And so I just find that this is a way that I can kind of get control of our Lego collection in one way, but in another way, it's just very interesting where your mind goes when you're putting your hands to something that is creative enough, but not so all-consuming that you have to be laser-focused on it. And so I've found those habits to be a helpful thing, in my life this year. Now when it comes to Advent, when it comes to Christmas, the four weeks before Christmas I have made a very determined habit the last couple of years and that is first of all I only watch movies and TV shows that are Christmas based or Christmas related and I only listen to music that is Christmas themed. So for those four weeks I'm all in on Christmas. I'm up to my eyeballs on the incarnation and Christmas cheer. And so I'm really invested in those things, and I find there's no end to it. There's no end to Christmas movies or shows I can be watching. There's no end to music I can be listening to. So, as you can guess, a number of movies make an appearance in my life every single year at Christmas. And what do you think some of those movies are? How the Grinch Stole Christmas. How the Grinch Stole Christmas. I think I missed that one this year, but it's great. Yes. Yeah. Home Alone. Home Alone. Yeah. That one veggie, I don't even know that one, but sure. Yeah. Yes. Hmm? 
Shazam, yes, I did watch Shazam for Christmas this year. It is a Christmas movie. What, Die Hard? Yes. Definitely Die Hard, which I do and do not recommend from, from behind the pulpit. Um, <clears throat> but one of the ones that was mentioned um, by Elijah is Home Alone. We watch it every single year. And as you can imagine, with good movies that you watch every single year, different details emerge. And there was one detail from Home Alone that I just found so profound when it came up. And I want you to kind of hear it for yourself. So I'm going to need a couple of volunteers. I need, uh, well, first of all, to explain the movie. Um, the movie itself, it's Kevin Mc... If you don't know it, if you live... If you, if you just don't know it. I'm not going to insult you because you don't know it. I haven't listened watched It's a Wonderful Life, and people take offense to that. So, um, Anyway, if you haven't watched it, Kevin McAllister, he's eight years old. He has a big family. He is sick to death of his family, and his family is sick to death of him. And around Christmas time, he says, I wish my family would disappear. Uh, in a mad scramble to get to the airport for a Christmas vacation to Paris, Kevin gets left behind at his giant house all by himself, and he has to learn to fend for himself and defend his house from bandits. And it's like the way I describe it sounds like a really depressing movie. It's not, it's a comedy and adventure movie. Anyway, there is a neighbor in Kevin's neighborhood that he is terrified of. There's all kinds of rumors about this elderly neighbor. And in one scene, Kevin and the neighbor end up on a Christmas, at a Christmas Eve service in the exact same pew and end up talking to one another. And what they talk about, I found very profound. So I need a couple of volunteers to read for this. Yes, come on down. Thank you, Fritz. I need one more. Sure, Ben, come on up. So I'm going to set the microphone up here for you. <clears throat> All right, Ben, because you got here first. Actually, no, Fritz, because you traveled the furthest. Which which character do you want, the old man or the kid? I'm, I'm older, so I'll take that. Okay, so you can you can your your lines are right there, and you can be the kid. Here's a toque that you can wear as Kevin. It looks kind of Kevinish. And here we go. So the scene is they're in church on Christmas Eve, having a conversation. You've been good this year. I think so. You swear it. No. Yeah, well, it's the place to be if you're feeling bad about yourself. It is? I think so. Are you feeling bad about yourself? No. I've been kind of a pain lately. I've had some things I shouldn't have. I really haven't been too good this year. Yeah, I'm kind of upset because I really like my family, even though sometimes I say I don't. Sometimes I even I think I don't. Do you get that? I think so. How do you feel about... F How do you feel about family is a complicated thing. Especially with an older brother. Deep down, you'll always love him. But you can forget that you love him. You can hurt them. They can hurt you. That's not just because you're young. And scene. Thank you very much, actors. <clears throat> so, when the scene took place, there was a point where I wanted to stand up and yell, Yes, or Amen. And, but that would have disturbed the rest of my family watching the movie. Um, and so the, it, when Kevin said, talks about his family, he says, I've been kind of a pain lately. I said some things I shouldn't have. I really haven't been too good this year. Yeah, I'm kind of upset because I, really like, I really like my family, even though sometimes I say I don't. And the old man responds with the truest words I've ever heard in a Christmas movie. How you feel about family is a complicated thing. And I thought, isn't that right? Right? And I think we find it more like we would think sometimes as things go on in life, things get more simplified. They don't. Things get more complicated as we go on in life. No one can love us like our family can, but also no one can hurt us quite like family can. And as we go through different stages with family, complications increase. Children can find themselves caring for parents, and it can be hard to live far away from your family. It can also be very hard to live close to your family. Family feels like there are no end of complications or grievances or pain. And sadly, church has the reputation of being the place and people where you cannot have a complicated family. 
It feels like the place you can't have a different kind of family. And somehow church has the reputation of multiplying a cookie cutter nuclear family. And if you don't have the cookie cutter nuclear family, then sometimes in churches we don't know what to do with you, which is a really sad thing. It's also weird because have any of us read the Bible? The author Jonathan Merritt was speaking with someone who had very strong views about how a biblical family ought to look and ought to behave. And Jonathan replied with, okay, from the Bible, give me an example of a model family. Based on all these principles you're telling me and all these roles within the family, find me an example from scripture. Find me a biblical family. And the person that was very proudly projecting what he thought the biblical family looked like, he was stumped. He couldn't think of any actual examples. There's good instructions about being a family in scripture. There's good instructions about how we be with one another and how we have character with one another. But the model family, it's really hard to find. Read through the book of Genesis and give me an example of the model family. I can find polygamy. I can find marriages between cousins, you know, when mom very proudly says, hey, do you know who would be great for you? Your cousin. That's all over Genesis. Jacob had cousins so nice, he married them twice. He married two cousins. That, and we don't think anything of it. But it's, it's pretty hard to find the ideal that we keep presenting to people of what family is supposed to look like. And we keep clobbering people over and over again of like, this is how the family ought to be. So I'm not trying to undermine the Bible and its teaching. Again, it's very important things in Scripture that tell us how to be present with one another as friends, as family, in all these kinds of situations. But the ideal we expect people to have is simply not found as an example in its pages. What we find instead, we find very broken people who are loved by God, being used by God to change the world, whether by them or by their very messy family. Which brings us to our passage in the book of John. How you feel about family is a complicated thing is true even for Jesus. And the book of John opens speaking highly of Jesus in cosmic terms. He's the word of God. Jesus was God, was with God in the beginning. Everything that's made has been made through Jesus. In Jesus' life, Jesus, very God, incarnate as a human, living among people, yet not fully understood by them. Jesus, Lord of all, with God from the very beginning. There's a very high view and a high presentation of who this Jesus is in the book of John. And then in chapter 2, we meet his family, his flesh and blood family. And there always seems to be tension between Jesus and the rest of his family. The eternal God that we worship has a family when he lives on earth. And I get the impression that Jesus and his family really annoy one another. Later in the book of John, this interaction between Jesus and his brothers is mentioned. Jesus' brothers said to him, leave Galilee and go to Judea so that your disciples there may see the works you do. No one who wants to become a public figure acts in secret. Since you are doing these things, show yourself to the world. For even his own brothers did not believe in him. And so we just see so much tension between them. Jesus' brothers being suspect of who he really is and not really having faith in him at all. So even the Son of God, our model for life, has a complicated family. And sometimes it seems that Jesus himself is the complicated number in his own family. When the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was tempted in all ways like we are, we know this is true because Jesus had a family. What is more crazy-making and tempting and makes you behave badly than your own family? What source of guilt is greater than your own family? Jesus knows what it's like to live in that kind of a system and what it is like to have those experiences. In the story Troy read this morning, it's Jesus' mother Mary that seems to be making life complicated for him. And we read, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. So the stage is set. A single man is at a wedding with his mom. What could go wrong? 
The stage is set for all kinds of awkwardness, family together at a wedding. I mean, you love hearing wedding stories from your friends. Like, you're, you're kind of hoping the wedding went well, but you're also hoping that you hear about something their family did that was totally crazy, right? We know those kinds of things can happen at weddings. And I read something last night that I thought was true with that too. Um, and the, the quote is, weddings are accidents waiting to happen. But beyond the usual awkwardness, the wedding has a problem. The wedding has run out of wine, which is a massive hospitality mistake. Mary, the mother of Jesus, tells him the news, and like only a family member can do, she tells him the news, telling him to do something without actually telling him to do something. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Her words have elbows to them. There's a wink and a nudge buried in these words. There's an expectation that Jesus do something about this. And Jesus replies, woman, why do you involve me? And Jesus replied, my hour has not yet come. Now, when I read these words, I was really hopeful that woman could have been taken in any number of ways. Whether it could be Jesus sighing and saying, woman, or Jesus angrily saying, woman, my time has not yet come. But it turns out the Greek only refers to this phrase in respect, which, which really disappointed me that it's a respectful term, because there's so many ways this could go that would really represent to us what it feels like to be in a family in those situations. Um, but at the same time, Jesus says it's not time for him to intervene in a miraculous way. He says, my time has not yet come, and he says this very specifically to his mom. But his mom doesn't seem to give up, because she then turns to the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. Mary has said what she has said to her son. She's leaving it with him, but she has really leaned on him in this situation to do something to intervene in this situation. She really seems to think that a miracle ought to happen today. Jesus turns the water to wine. A miracle takes place, and the wine made in the miracle far surpasses the original wine that was provided at the wedding. In the book of John, this is Jesus' very first miracle. It's the very first one that he does. And so, does this miracle take place if Mary does not nag or lean on Jesus? If she doesn't bother Jesus, the Son of God, with this information, does the miracle ever take place? Without the awkwardness here, do we have this first miracle even taking place in the book of John? Uh, John is very specific in the theology and the ways that it lays out information about Jesus. It is very clear on its theology or its thinking about Jesus and very orderly. There's seven signs that take place or seven miracles that take place that reveal who Jesus is and his role in the world. Uh, and yet at the same time, while it says these very, very clear things, the context of John is always very awkward, very messy, very outsider kind of people. And we see that with his interaction with his family as well. A bigger reality is represented here. Jesus isn't just being kind. He's not just saving the day in a specific situation. There's a bigger reality being represented here. Uh, and Abram JK or KJ says, the wedding at Cana, in fact, serves as a foreshadowing of a great heavenly banquet where Jesus is the groom. And he invites everyone, not just in the whole town, but across many nations. It's not just a week-long wedding celebration, but an eternal one with Jesus as host. And so this miracle is a much, much bigger scope than just what happens in this town on this day. Does this bigger picture miracle ever happen without Mary doing what she did with Jesus, without the awkward behavior of a mom at a wedding? If someone were to ask, why did Jesus choose the wedding at Cana to provide this miracle or do this miracle? An answer might be, well, Jesus didn't choose this. His mother did which is really weird. But because she did, what we read about Jesus early in John is proven true. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth. So we have a Savior in Jesus that we worship, that we revere. He's holy. There's no one like him. And the same recipient that we gave our worship to this morning lived in an awkward family just like us. Now, I will never pretend to know what it's like for you to live in your particular situation with your own family. 
I will never know that or feel that what your own family dynamics have been in your life. I won't ever be able to say to you, I know what that's like, because even if you and I were to go through the exact same thing, how we feel it and perceive it and experience it is two wildly different things in a lot of situations. Family is messy and awkward and painful in its very own specific way. It's loss in its very own specific way. It's a very unique experience for everyone that has been part of a family in one way or another. And it is amazing to me that when God comes to earth, God very purposely lives within a family and all the awkwardness that it entails. The family is tense, it's by times lonely, it's by times painful. And then sometimes the family that's, that, is in, that Jesus is connected with, sometimes that family just goes to a wedding and then goes and hangs out after. Like I love how this passage ends with verse 12. After this, they went down to Capernaum with his mother and brothers and his disciples. There they stayed for a few days. After the wedding, after this miracle happens, Jesus and his family just go and hang out. They just spend time together. Jesus knows the mess of what family is like. He intentionally lived in it, and he knows you. He knows your family. He knows your family situations. He knows any hurts or shame that that entails. He knows your heart within that too. He knows your great joy within family experiences. He knows your great disappointments. And Jesus has truly lived the human experience. Jesus is God with us. Know that in what you are experiencing today in your life as it relates to family. May Christ have mercy as he is present with us and with our connections to one another. Let's pray. God, we're so grateful for today. We thank you for how much you love us, you care for us. And we thank you that time and time again we can look to the Bible and see examples of Jesus living life just like us. Whether it's living life awkwardly with family, whether it's just going to weddings and hanging out after, whatever it is, God, we thank you that we can see Jesus hanging in situations much like ours. And we thank you, God, that you know us, that you know every single one of us individually and specifically, that you love every single one of us individually and specifically, and that you also love the people that we are associated with and connected to, and that you love us as a church as well. God, we ask today that you would help us to give ourselves grace and give one another grace as it relates to our connections to one another. We ask, God, that you would help us to remember that you are powerfully present and sometimes just very subtly present within all the affairs of our lives. God, we thank you that you are with us and that you are good. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like you to stand in response to Mark's message this morning of how God uses each one of us, the humble, the weak, and uses them all. Thank you. 
joining us uh, for worship this morning. Make sure that you take a time to uh, maybe talk to someone around you, maybe someone you haven't seen in a while or someone you've never met before. And also there is coffee in the fireside room if you would like to hang out and talk with people after. Let's just close our time together in prayer. God, we're so grateful for you. We thank you for all the ways in which Jesus has shown us the way in which to live our lives. And we thank you for the ways in which Jesus has come into the messiness and still allows it to be messy, but still works within it. And we ask God that you would help us to not be going for some level of perfection in our lives, but just to recognize that you are present, you are near, and to follow you wherever you lead. We thank you for your goodness, for your grace. We ask you would help us to extend that to others. In Jesus' name, amen. Go in peace.